All right. Hello, everybody. This is Dr. Bill with World Bible School, and welcome to Healed Because God Said So. Uh, looks like I might be flying solo tonight, but uh, nonetheless, I'm trying out this uh, mic, um, this, this podcast mic, trying to see, um, you know, so your feedback would be greatly appreciated. Uh, how are you hearing me there? And so on. Good to see Linda Routley, one of our students joining us tonight. Good to see Deborah Adcock joining us tonight. Robert Dungay, my friend from the UK, joining us tonight. And uh, looks like a bunch of other people are joining us tonight. So very glad you're on here with me tonight. And um, uh, we're thankful for all of you. Uh, we appreciate you so very, very much for being so uh, dedicated to watch our broadcast because without you, uh, really there are uh, you know, it's just me talking into a mic and hey, I can record this stuff, but uh, I'd rather have uh, you in the chat room watching your comments and so on. So uh, tonight on Healed Because God Said So, we have left the series um, New Realities of the Christ Consciousness Within, uh, not for any reason other than that it just seemed to be that place where Holy Spirit um, kind of, it just got brought to that place. So uh, looks like um, looks like Dr. Cindy Coates is joining me. All right, and um, yeah, so there's Dr. Cindy, and I am minus um, uh, Apostle Germain. How you doing, my sister? I'm doing good. How are you doing? I'm good. I'm good. I'm uh, trying out a new mic tonight, and. I can see already that the volume is going to have to be turned up, but uh, so how are you hearing me? I'm hearing you good. It's a little bit muffled, but it's good. I can hear you clearly. So if it's a little bit muffled, then that may mean that I'm not up loud enough. Is that better? Yeah, I like it okay. louder. Okay. Okay. Well, I get a little echo. I've got a speaker turned away, way in the back. So anyway, uh, good to see everybody joining us tonight. Um, good to have Dr. Cindy. And um, I'm assuming Apostle Jermaine may be running late, work kind of schedules are kind of uh, getting back into motion um, and such. But uh, anyway, uh, we're glad everybody is on here with us tonight. And like I said, we have finished, uh, for now we've dropped the uh, new realities of the Christ consciousness within. Uh, not that that particular subject couldn't have went on and on and on and on and on because there's so much. Uh, to be gained from a topic like that. But, but tonight we're going to be talking about uh, part one of Righteousness Unveiled. And I wanted to immediately go to a scripture that uh, seems to be everybody's go-to verse. Uh, good to see Stacy Ferguson joining us tonight. Uh, everybody's go-to verse when we talk about righteousness, actually, uh, and I know there's probably a lot of them, but what seems to be is... Um, here in 2 Corinthians 5.21. Let me say hello to Charlotte Anderson real quick. And uh, many, many people are watching us tonight. So we're grateful for that. So uh, 2 Corinthians 5.21, starting with the New King James, and I'd like to look at about three different translations and anything else that Dr. Cindy might be bringing to the table. Uh, but it says, for he made him who knew no sin to be sin for us, that we might become the righteousness of God in him. Now, there's a lot of things I'd like to say about this, and I'm sure a lot of things that we have on the, the table tonight that um, are going to be said, but let me just start off by saying, when we talk about this verse, usually from the King James or the New King James, we get the idea that uh, he, God, made him Jesus, who never knew sin, just looking at it from face value, to be sin for us, and be here uh, to be uh, is usually replaced with to become sin for us, but to be is actually italicized and a good chance that it really was not in the original language. And so we want to understand this from, from several sides or perspectives of scripture uh, and said that we might become the righteousness of God in him, which again, now we have instead of to be, we actually have the words become or the word become. And it says basically that we're going to become something that we've been teaching all along that we already are. So everyone needs to you know, know this verse and needs to look at this verse. And I teach this verse quite a bit in college. Uh, so I, I have laid out several questions tonight, not necessarily 
questions that our, our audience needs to answer, but, but several questions that this verse brings up. The first question is, did Jesus know sin? And, and the answer is no. Uh, and, and we'll qualify that tonight. Uh, the second question that arises is, did Jesus become sin? And again, the answer is no. Uh, there's another uh, uh, aspect to this, and before we give that third aspect, and before I have Dr. Cindy share her heart on this uh, scripture, uh, the first thing to know is that Jesus did not become sin because the word sin comes from the Greek word hamartia, which is defined as to be mistaken or to miss the mark, which we very commonly know that from our good friend James Strong, who has really helped so many with the, the introduction of the Strong's Exhausted Concordance. However, James Strong wrote the, the, the Strong's Concordance about 1800 years after the original Koen Greek. So uh, could it be possible that he missed some things? Uh, I, I would say yes, that it is. It's, it's not only possible, but it's highly uh, likely. It's more of an absolute uh, because uh, Jesus had never uh, uh, been mistaken or had ever missed the mark. So that's oh. the first thing. And so the extended definition of hamartia, of course, goes to our, our repeated uh, uh, thing we've been saying is it's mistaken identity. And the one thing I love about Jesus is that he was never mistaken about his identity. And, and plus, uh, that, that would bring me to a third question, which is, was Jesus ever mistaken about his identity? And the answer is no. So, you know, here's the thing. I'll be teaching in the morning on Revelation 21, verse 1, and I'm really going to be addressing this more heavily, just not because I paired the two deliberately, because uh, this program was put together before the other program, but uh, it's, it's because what happened was is that mankind who followed the Adam religion, and I call it the Adam religion. I'm, I may be one of you who have labeled it the Adam religion. You can call it the Adam lie, uh, uh, but those who followed the Adam religion became mistaken about their identity. And so before we get too deep into that and too many other translations, uh, Dr. Cindy, uh, what about this issue? You know, when we talk about righteous, we got people who you uh, uh, do life coaching and other people do mentoring and, and, and psychological counseling and all that. And it's always about the issue of who am I? What am I about? Why am I doing what I'm doing? You know, when am I going to get it right? And it's always about identity, particularly mistaken identity. So please talk to us tonight. This is one of my favorite subjects, righteousness. I, I'm so happy we're talking about this tonight. It is so foundational. It's yes. so important. It's so important. It is, it is the most important thing I think any of us can wrap our mind around um, concerning our spiritual life, concerning our faith, um, because we have to develop a righteousness consciousness, mm -hmm. not a sin consciousness. Again, Jesus never sinned. If he had sinned, I mean, we even go as far to say if Jesus had eaten a pork chop, <laughs> he wouldn't have been able to die on the cross for our sins. I mean, he kept the law. He fulfilled the law and he did not sin. He was the only person ever i mean my mother's family are, are french jews and we love to point this out a lot how jesus was completely he, he fulfilled all uh messianic prophecy he fulfilled the law and he brought in um righteousness into the earth apart from the law totally apart from the law. Um, a scripture that a lot of people have quoted throughout my life uh, in church over the years, and probably some of yours as well, is uh, how about um, over in Romans 3, where it says, um, there's none righteous, no, not one. None righteous, no, no, not one. And, and you know, whenever someone is preaching like that, they're about to lay some heavy condemnation on you, right? They're going right. to get you all condemned and feeling, you know, like 
there's no way in the world you can ever measure up. So you better crawl down to the altar and, and cry and, and, and try to, you know, shed enough tears so that God will like you again or something like that. So it's, it's so, it's so bad, but let me just say, if you continue to read, that's what happens when we don't read in context, because if it's yeah. not in context, then it's pretext and pretext is error. Pretext is error. So in context, um, kind of switching gears over here to Romans chapter three, where it says, um, you know, there's none righteous, no, not one. Okay. And then it goes on down to verse 21. It says, but now, but now the righteousness of God, apart from the law is revealed being witnessed by the law and the prophets. In other words, look for the, but, you know, go look for, but go look for the, but because all that was pertaining to the law wasn't pertaining to where we are now. That's why we call this present truth. Cause we have to, whenever it says, but now you got to circle that word now in your Bible, because that means a new thing has happened. A new thing has happened. So our righteousness is the righteousness of God. We don't even have righteousness apart from God. Um, but God's righteousness is apart from the law. We were never born under the law. We shouldn't even be thinking about it. We shouldn't even, that should never exactly. even be a topic. But um, yeah, I don't know if that's somewhere where you're going with this, but that's what came to me. Yeah, you know, because the, the reality is, is that we, we get this idea in, in modern Christendom that the more I do, the better positioned I am. So when you take righteousness, righteousness or righteous the root word is right and when we think we the more we do that is right the more right we become but let's face it anything that we can do in our humanness that makes us more right takes away from everything that that uh, the eternal christ did and yes. you know there was there was the bible says that he was sacrificed uh before the foundation of the world Yes. Uh, so yes. that means that any sacrifice needed or anything uh, to be, because when you talk about the sacrifice, especially from the Jewish culture, you're talking about, first of all, it has to be prepared. So anything that was prepared was prepared from before the foundation of the, the world, or I like the Passion Translation, the, before the foundation of the universe. And, and so since it was prepared then, all that happened when Christ came was he reconnected our mind back to the Father's mind. Now, that would have not had to happen or needed to happen if we did not got off track. But here again, when I talk about the Adam lie, the Adam lie is the lie of separation. Yes. And that lie of separation became a religion that immediately his children, Adam's children, bought into. And so Cain builds a city uh, to be a name that would that re, a name to be remembered for his children and grandchildren, and and then you have the the uh, the children of Israel, and you have all of those the Old Testament uh, characters who followed after that same pattern, believing that now I got to have the law, and I've got to have not just the Ten Commandments, but the 613 laws, and all of that. I've got to do, all, and I got to keep all of this stuff because if I break one, I'm guilty of all, and so therefore it becomes a matter of self effort, self-work, self-righteousness, and there is no effort of, uh, you know, what I've divided, Dr. Cindy, I've divided everything down to, and I'll be, bring, this is new, brand new, I've never heard nobody say this, but I'll break, be presenting this in the morning's uh, show, that the difference between who we were before visibility in this natural realm and who we think we are is, is the difference of the spirit form and the human form. And so in the spirit form, we should know who we are. We're being reawakened to who we are. But in the human form, we believe to hold other concept. And that other concept is what ultimately climaxed in the Babylonian, not just the Tower of Babel, but that years later, and I, I forget, and I think it was 540 something BC, the, the city of, of Babylon was destroyed. And, uh, and it was all based on self-sufficiency. Everybody depended on Babylon for supply, not God, but Babylon. And then you have the New Testament. You have not just the disciples who were steeped in that um, uh, Jewish uh, mindset, that Old 
covenant mindset, but you have the Pharisees, the Sadducees, the scribes, the priests, the, 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 all of those. And now you have a first century culture mixed of, of Jews, uh, Gentiles, and, and others, I'll just put it that way, who now believe that they're under this, this rule of, of the mindset of Babylon. Babylon's destroyed, but they're still under that rule in their own mind. And John brings them all the way from Genesis chapter 2 to the end of Revelation chapter 20, just to show them that God declared the end from the beginning, and the way it was in, in eternity past is the way it is. And I'm, that's what I love about starting Revelation 21-1 in the morning. And, and so, so we do not have uh, let me say it this way, uh, the human uh, form of thinking is that which was in Adam that said, I have a, a, a fallen or a mistaken mindset, a separated mindset, and see the, the very essence of trying to do better, to get better, or trying to do better to make me more right with God is that because, is because psychologically, I believe I'm separated. Okay, I'm separating. I got to do something to get it straightened out. So if I don't get it straightened out, then I'm never going to be connected back to God. And I'm never going to be righteous. And see, none of that even holds true with Scripture. Amen. Amen. Because the body of Christ is not decapitated. No. We are connected to the head. We are connected to Jesus, to Christ. We are. Christ is all-encompassing. The body and the head's connected. Mm -hmm. um, the, the church is not, you know, a headless body running around the earth waiting for the head to come back from outer space to connect to it. Mm -hmm. You know, we're not, that's, and that's really what it sounds like You when a lot of uh, people talk about, you know, what they're looking forward to. And I'm going, you don't see yourself already connected. So, that whole idea of feeling like I've got to do something in order to get better or to yeah. improve, you know, I mean, God bless any Mormons who are watching, but that's a, that's what you guys have been taught <laughs> that you've got to continue to keep doing things. And eventually, you know, you'll be um, approved. Uh, but see, we were already approved. We, we were already approved. I believe before we were born, and then was, yeah, we, we were approved and validated by God before we were born into this earth. Um, but, and we discovered that whenever we accepted Christ as our Lord and Savior, you know, when we became awakened to righteousness, which is what we're to do, is to be awakened to righteousness. Because it's not something that we invent or, or something that's brand new we've got to uh, apprehend. We have to apprehend that which was already apprehended for us. Come on. You know, uh, we, yeah. we it's already been apprehended for us. The struggle is over. Okay, so I was talking to a minister, precious man of God, and he was saying, I feel like I've disappointed God. I feel like I've disappointed God. And I said, well, hang on a minute. Let me pray about that for a second. I mean, I seriously want to go ask God what he has to say about it. And I said, Father, what do you say about that? What do you say about that when people say they disappoint you? And he, I heard the Lord laughing in the spirit. I heard the Lord laughing. And you know what he said? He said, they can't disappoint me because they did not appoint me. Hmm. You can't disappoint God because you didn't appoint him. You can only disappoint that which you appointed. Say, say that again, would you? Yeah. Okay. The Lord said this. I mean, it's a bomb, really. It's, it was a heavy bomb in, in my heart. He goes, you cannot disappoint me because you did not appoint me. You didn't appoint me, so you can't disappoint me. See, for God to be disappointed, he would then have to take on a human characteristic and live in the slump. Yeah. yeah. The, or the, let's just say the depression of disappointment. Pretty yeah. much. And when I told that, that pastor friend of mine what God said, he was like, wow. I go, that's when God speaks, it's pretty wow, you know, but it, but it's just, it's so simple when you think about it. 
you can't disappoint that which you didn't appoint. You see, so we can't disappoint God because we didn't appoint God. We, it's impossible for you to disappoint God. You can't disappoint God. So get that out of your mind. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And it's unfortunate that the, the lessons we learn about Father God, we uh, learn from natural fathers sometimes. And it's not this case with all natural fathers, but there are natural fathers who express excessive disappointment in their children because their children didn't perform well enough. And see, so now we equate that to God and we think that, okay, I didn't perform well enough. So God must be disappointed in me. And so now I have to perform harder. But here again, the whole premise of the law was self-effort. So yes. again, if I do, then I get, and if I don't do, then I, the only thing I get is cursed and I get left out and, and see, that's, that's not true. And so, you know, here, here's what I, what I love about my studies about creation is, is that in eternity past, and, and, and let me just, let me just see if I can remember a verse. Um, there's a, a, a man that wrote several, rewrote several verses from the Hebrew, and in Genesis 1, verse 1, in this particular translation, uh, he writes, in, in a beginning, which was not a beginning, in eternity past, Elohim created, created out of nothing the entire universe, including planet Earth. Now, when we talk about planet Earth, we immediately have been so, so um, uh, uh, schooled to believe in this round ball like I have in the background of my, my screen uh, as planet Earth. But if you study it out, it can refer to more than one thing in the Hebrew, and it also can include a people. And, wow. and so, a pe yeah, a people were made uh, on that, in, in that moment. And so, uh, you know, and I, I just love the fact that before there was an atom, there was spirit beings, there was all creation who was ever, and, and, you know, here's one of the things, when you look at the word Adam, uh, Adam, uh, you first see it in Genesis 126, when it says God made man, it didn't say God made mad, Adam, it says God made man, although that's the Hebrew word Adam, um, but, but that word there in context refers to a species known as mankind or, or humankind, aka mankind. But then when you get over to Genesis chapter 2, and uh, I forget which verse, but where you, you see Adam for the first time, the word Ad Adam is Adam, but it actually comes from a root word that's Adam, not Adam, but Adam, and it actually refers to Adam the man. So Adam the man and Adam, mankind, uh, spirit beings are, are not the same word. And so we've mistakenly thought that we had to take our cue from Adam, from somebody who was, you know, kind of like the, the and, and you know, in scripture, when it talks about the forefathers of our faith, Adam is not mentioned. It's, it's Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Yes. But it's not Adam. But yet we take our cue from Adam saying that, well, that's what he believes. So that's what I've got to believe. And I'm not trying to knock Adam because, you know, you know Adam, Adam uh, had an opportunity to, to be right with God. He had an opportunity to, to get all this straightened up in his thinking and, and so on. And I just did a lesson in my psychology class uh, taught on, um, on Cain and that whole scenario of what Cain went through emotionally and what prompted him to do what he did. But the, the, the reality is this, that my, my, uh, my God is not Adam. My God is my father. And I was created like my father. I was not created like Adam. So any shortcomings that Adam uh, experienced or expressed uh, are not the shortcomings that I have to embrace. Now, it's obvious that we've embraced Adam's shortcomings because we were taught by religion to do that. But thank God we, are we're, we get to make some choices and we yes. get to reverse that thing. You know, you know the fact is, is that Noah, uh, his ark landed on Mount Ararat, uh, a reverse of the curse. And, and the Bible uh -huh. says that Noah found rest. Noah and this would 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 be translated in the Greek in the Hebrew that grace 
yeah. found rest. Yeah. And the way to experience grace to the, the, uh, the person of grace is to be in the rest of the father, not in this labor. And I got to get better and do better because, you know, Jesus is about to come and I'm going to miss it and I'm going to go to hell. And, 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 and while I don't believe in any of that, uh, still, we've had that thing that the church has projected now we've got the world scared we've got other believers scared people don't want to attend church services anymore i mean i'm just saying that you know we really do need to understand that we were created righteous and my question would be this if you were created righteous in the father how could you ever be anything less that's right i mean we we, we are the very righteousness of god in christ jesus I mean, that is our identity. It totally is. You mentioned psychology. Um, I, I'm, not, I'm not really a counselor. So I'm shaking this. Uh, I'm on a, I got a laptop sitting on a music stand because I live in a house full of musicians. Okay. And, and it, it wobbles sometimes. We're not having an earthquake in Atlanta. Just in case you see it wiggle, I'm okay. Okay. But anyway. So um, you mentioned your psychology class. And like I was saying, most people, especially here around here, they know I'm not really a counselor because, um, but, but, this, but when I counsel, which is rare, um, and when I teach counseling, which I don't claim to do, <laughs> um, this is what I say. When I'm talking to someone, I say, are you having problems with your joy? And of course they'll say, oh yes, I, I just, I feel like I've lost my joy. And I go, okay, so how about your peace? Are you at peace? Mm -hmm. And then they'll say, oh no, I'm not. I, I, I don't have peace. And I know now we're gonna talk about righteousness because I believe it's in that order righteousness produces peace and peace produces joy and i feel like anytime for me when i counsel somebody i go through that uh reversal are you how are you doing with your joy level i'm not having joy okay what about your peace my peace is gone well then we're going to go and we're going to make sure you know who you are we're going to make sure that we, you know your identity that you are the very righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. And you can't disappoint God. You can't make God happy because he's already happy. You know, you, you can't do anything to make God any more awesome. And you can't do anything to make you any more awesome in his eyes. Because when he sees you, he sees Jesus. Mm -hmm. And nobody's, you know, and once you get into alignment with that truth, that you are one with the father. He's one with you. God is righteous. Jesus is righteous. And our identity needs to be in him. If we read the Bible, that's what's the problem. Too many people aren't really reading the scriptures or studying them. We are in yeah. Christ. We are in him. We're in Christ. You can't be in Christ and unrighteous. What did you do? Bring unrighteousness into Christ? No, not at all. See, you didn't contaminate Christ because you're you're unrighteous. So you came into Christ, you contaminate contaminated him. It's impossible. See, we, he made us righteous. It was all on his end. He made us righteous, and 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 um, we have been duped. Really, I believe we've been duped. We've been played. We've been punked. We've been whatever you want to call it. it depends on which um, which culture you come from, but right. um, we've seriously been, I believe, been deceived to think that we are unrighteous. That is like this sounds very ugly. What I'm about to say, it really does, and I don't mean to offend anybody or say anything vulgar, but to call ourselves unrighteous is to be like spitting in the face of Jesus. It is so derogatory. It is so horribly, horribly rude to say we are unrighteous and, and, to, and to forfeit the righteousness that God bestowed upon us in the sacrifice of his son. 
And even that happened when, you keep saying when, before the foundations of the world, of the earth, before the yeah. universe, before the universe mm -hmm. was created. See, and that time sensitive, you keep interjecting that. So people realize that this thing was a done deal even before the creation of the universe. Yeah. And, and, and again, you know, if all you see to what Jesus did was that three and a half years, uh, you've really missed so much uh, because he is not just Jesus, the Christ, the son of the living God. He is the eternal Christ. Okay, and you know, John and John agree that uh, John, well, I say John from the gospel and then from the book of Revelation that, you know, he's the one that always has been, you know, John, uh, the gospel of John says that he was the word, um, you know, he was with God, he was, he was uh, there with God, he was uh, God in the beginning where uh, Revelation chapter one says that he, he was and is and, and is to come, which translated in the Greek is that he's he's manifesting in your awareness and and so it's really amazing to me to say that I am not something that God says that I am when all I have to go on is an English Bible from the 21st century or thereabouts uh, when the Bible was not written not even in the first century but the words were spoken then and so they begin to put them together um, um, uh, AD um, 300, the end of 300, somewhere in there. And so, uh, but let me just say this about this scripture, because uh, uh, one of the things I realized is that Jesus became, and, and I want everybody to understand that Jesus became, Jesus was not becoming, um, you know, God didn't make him to become, uh, who knew no sin to become sin. Jesus became or manifested to reveal uh, uh, to all mankind that their identity of who they thought God was and who they thought they were was really a mistaken mindset. Let me read this scripture from the, um, from the, the, the complete Jewish Bible. It says, God made this sinless man. So here we have another, and I, I would say to everybody, don't shun translations because they don't agree with the King James or New King James. Uh, I, you know, my go-to translation is usually the King, New King James version, followed up by the Passion Translation, followed up by multiple other translations, uh, because the only way you can get a good view of something, if you're going to build a house, you don't look at one floor plan, look at many floor plans. And I say that as 25 years in construction and 15 of those years as a construction foreman building anything from government housing to three and $400,000 homes. Don't just look at one floor plan. If you're going to change a room, don't just look at one design, look at multiple designs. Well, we've gotten such a habit of saying, look at these scriptures. These say that the King James is the only right translation. No, I can take the same scriptures and look at my translations and say, these translations are the only right ones. But I will say, one of the things we've noticed is that since the early days, as the Bible began to be translated and, and study helps began to be uh, formed that they usually went off of some of the earlier translations. Do you realize that when, uh, um, when um, uh, let me say it this way, uh, when uh, James Strong uh, wrote the Strong's Concordance and, and then the Thayer's Lexicon and all of those things began to be formed, uh, they had very few translations now. In 1611, a translation came out of, of a divided country. It was not for the whole country. It was not for the whole world. It was for a division in Britain and authorized by King James for this Bible to be translated. Uh, and, and I will say some of my studies have told me that the Catholic Church was very influential in that translation. Let's just say the contents of the translation. But that really doesn't matter to me uh, because even before that, the first complete English Bible was in 1380, the John Wycliffe Bible. And, you know, before that, there was a 
English Old Testament and English New Testament, several of them. And so, you know, the, the, the King James was such a, a non-popular translation among uh, King James. They actually uh, revised it about 100 years after that. And, and, you know, our alphabet changed. We have two more letters that weren't in the alphabet then that were added to the alphabet. And the spelling of words changed. I mean, a lot of things changed. So you can't really just jump at a translation and say that's the only one. And so when I look at this in the complete Jewish Bible, uh, it says God made this sinless man. So one of the first things we addressed tonight was, was Jesus. Did Jesus sin? You know, he was a sinless man. And it says uh, this, he, he made this sinless man to be a sin offering. Now, I know kingdom people, and I'll just say this because I've been around kingdom people who say that Jesus was not sin or didn't become sin, but it beca he became the sacrifice for sin. Well, let me take that a step further and just say it this way, that, that this sinless man uh, was not made to be sin in terms of the way we understand sin until we break it down and define it as mistaken identity. So now this sinless man was made to be uh, or to stand in our place because he didn't have mistaken identity, we did. And so he stood in our place or it says clearly on our behalf so that in union with him, we might fully share God's righteousness. Now, we've always had righteousness. You know, it, it amazes me when I look at scriptures that says there's no, Paul says the love of God. There's nothing that can separate you from the love of God in Christ Jesus. And I'll say again, in the eternal Christ, we have scriptures that say that he made you holy and he made you without blame. He made you um, uh, with, without blame in his sight. Now, if I'm without blame in his sight, if I have an unstained innocence in his sight, here again, I mean, let's let's be honest. Who are we as the created to tell the creator how wrong he is? Because he says we're righteous and we say we're not. He says we're where we have an unstained innocence about us and we say we don't. And he says we're without blame and we say we're not. And we, we go through all of this religious rigmarole of trying to tell God what he said about us just isn't the truth. Now we got another issue. We call God a liar. Yeah. And I, and I don't think it's dangerous because God's not offended. But I think at the same time, what it does is it shortchanges you because God's trying to get some wrong mindsets corrected in us that have uh, have been uh, uh, thrown aside ever since uh, the, the Adam religion. You're right. I mean, you just said it. You said it better than I think I've ever heard it. Just now I was about to start crying. <laughs> It's such an anointing on what you were saying. It was so anointed. I mean, God shared his righteousness, his righteousness with us. And it is, it is, you know, we should never, ever, ever allow ourselves to condemn ourselves by, by saying we're unrighteous or that we're, we're, um, the word of God said Christ made us bl blameless. You know, there is therefore now, now no condemnation yeah. there's none zero you know and and the whole the whole idea of um putting condemnation on other people you know it, it's manipulative really it's like what is your what is your goal you're certainly not listen anybody who uses that kind of tactic and call that ministry it's not it's manipulation pure and simple it is it's abusive. It's, it's straight up abuse because you're lying about God. <laughs> and God is love. He is straight up love all the way. Mm -hmm. He's light. He's light. There's no dark side. The Bible says there is no shadow of darkness in him. He's bright as the noonday sun. That just means, you know, at the noontime, the sun is straight up and there's no shadow. I mean, it's, you're, there is no shadow at, with the noonday sun. You know, and that's his righteousness is bright as a noonday sun. Mm -hmm. He's caused us to be that our righteousness would shine as bright as the noonday sun. There's no dark side. There's no shadow. There's no darkness in him, in his righteousness. You know, it is bright. It is just a, a brightness. It's a shining. It is a brilliance. And it's to, a beautiful thing to behold. 
and and we should never let any religious system or religious dogma ever put that stuff on us ever ever i mean a lot of us have come out of that you know some people watching right now perhaps are still coming out of it or this might be the first time you've ever heard such a thing but you know in your spirit you're excited you feel the truth you know the truth is in there and something is being quickened in your spirit because that's what truth does it brings joy it brings hope it brings an energy and excitement and you go that's got to be god because i feel so alive when i hear this and that, that's how you know that's how i know i'm hearing truth it's like it's speaking life to me and that's what righteousness is it's the life of god yeah it's awesome absolutely absolutely and and you know here's the thing um you know i was just reading a comment by brett erickson in the chat room and it it, it just made me think about um our original design and, and and how how david said to god you know who who is man that you are mindful of him Amen. Uh, you know just bits and pieces but david says in psalm 80 says you, you've crowned him with glory and honor you know you know and we're not talking <laughs> about here again we're talking about man Genesis 126, man, uh, this, this, uh, this species known to God as mankind. And, you know, he, he says, he says here, um, mindful of who I am, the great I am, that I am the creator, the beginning and the end. And that's Father God. What, you, you know, when you, when you, when you get to the book of Revelation, one of the things that most theologians will talk about is the end. And they, they'll preface the word end, as in the book of Revelation, chapter 22, last verse, is the end. But it's not the end, because you have to look at, at things in terms of the age of man um, from um, Christ to uh, in, the, the new, in the Gospels to the, the end of the 6,000th year, uh, the 7,000th year, and then now you're entering the 7,000th year. And, you know, according to some Hebrew calendars, we actually entered the 7,000th year, um, if you want to be technical about it, uh, about 2012. Uh, and what the 7,000th year is, and see, I'm not a believer in an 8,000th year. If you want to look at numbers in the Bible, eight being the number of new beginnings, I agree. But if, you, but if you're looking at a, a, an 8,000th year like some uh, theologians believe in, now you're talking about there's going to be a new beginning. Of some, but, but how much more of a new beginning do I need than coming into the revelation? Of Amen. <laughs> and so the 7,000th the year for me really does, it, it's verified in the Greek language in, in Revelation 10 verse 5 that says, um, about 5 verse 10 uh, that says he has made us uh, kings and priests and we shall reign with him on the earth. Now, there's too many shalls because shall doesn't mean in the Greek language what it means in the English language. But but when we look at that and you break it down in the Greek, really what it really says is that he has made us a kingdom of priests and we reign, period. That's it. We reign. When do we reign? Well, we've always reigned. Uh, what did he say in Genesis 126? Again, uh, he, he gave them dominion. Yes. That's reigning, authority to rule. So so we've always reigned, but the reality is, is we just didn't know we no reigned. And, and, and so the, the fact is that, that when we talk about who we are, this is not a matter of God, get on board with my theology. This is, hey, Dr. Bill, get on board with God's theology. Dr. Cindy, uh, we talk about present truth and present truth and, and, and unconditional love and all the things we teach is all subjected to God's theology. And as we understand God's mind, you know what happens? Our theology changes. I tell people I believe what I believe and I'll continue to believe what I believe. But check back with me tomorrow because I might have a new download and my believing may be upgraded a little bit. I may see some things differently. So this is such an important thing tonight that this sinless God uh, manifests as visible and he steps in on our behalf. And it's through that union we have with him that he shared his father's righteousness. Now, again, 
that took place from before the foundation of the earth. What I talk, think about is this, is what the cross was about. It really was the ratifying. It was yes. the verifying, the solidifying of what God did from in, in eternity past. And now we have been reassured. You know, he's given us the reassurance or the assurance of his spirit. There's a witness of Holy Spirit that says, you know what? I am who God says I am. No, you know, John Olstein, and I know you remember John Olstein, and then there's Joel Olstein. And, you know, he used to always say, you know, this is my Bible. I have what it says I have. I, I can do what it says I can do. I am what it says I am. It went through that every single broadcast, and Joel does that now. And I, and I think, when are we going to catch on? You know, I, I am what it says I am. I, I am who it says I am. I, I can do what it says I can do. Yeah. And we, we say that as a little, you know, format for just following along with their broadcast. But how about really believing that? Because that really is the clincher for me. See, the fact is that God did not make the eternal Christ to be a sin offering, but to stand in for our mistaken identity so that when he went to the place of the skull, he died. And Paul said he died, but not I, yet I was crucified with him. And so I got reconnected back to God so that that mindset, that mistaken identity could be turned around to thinking correctly. And I love that about God. I do too. You know, I, I the Lord gives me funny stories, okay, um, sometimes. And, and I, I just have to go with it because I think maybe it's going to help somebody. <laughs> But when I was a teenager back in the seventies, we had shag carpet. How many, how many, how many had shag carpet? Testify. <laughs> and uh, right. And so um, one time I was in my bedroom barefooted in the shag carpet and mm -hmm. I stepped and I stepped on a lizard. <laughs> a lizard had gotten into my room. And I stepped on a lizard and I screamed so loud. And my mother came running in there, what's wrong? And I go, I stepped on a lizard. I was like 13 years old. So I mean, I was a young teenager just having a fit on this lizard, you know? And uh, what was so gross is that tail broke off. His tail broke off and he's running around without a tail and it's bleeding. It's so awful. It was like a, a monster movie. It was so awful. And his little tail was like flapping around on the, in the carpet. And I was just gross. I was grossed out so bad. And my mother, she wasn't afraid of anything. And she got a paper towel and she grabbed on that broken off lizard tail and threw it in the trash. I just, I was just squirming the whole time. It was so bad. Well, that little lizard that had his tail broke off went and hid somewhere. I was scared to go to sleep at night. I thought he was going to get out of his hiding place and come crawl on me and get even, you know, like you stepped on my tail, I'm going to come get you. I was scared. And so, um, you know, my mother had to come in there and say, you just need to calm down and pray and to ask God to give you peace and keep that lizard away from you. And all. <laughs> I, I mean, I really had to grow in my faith back then. I did. I grew in my faith during this whole time. And um, this lizard uh, would come out every now and then and his tail started to grow back. It, I mean, it got longer and he'd go hide when he would see me and run off, you know, and I was trying to kind of get a get him in a shoe box and put him back outside or something and every time i saw him make his appearance his tail kept growing and it was growing back and it, i saw a science project right there in my shag carpet you know and um you know on a totally different scenario years later the lord explained that kind of thing to me when he asked me about a starfish he said, you know, when a starfish gets one of his extremities broken off into the ocean, it grows it back, doesn't it? And I, you know, I said, yes, Lord. Um, same thing with this lizard. It grows back the tail. Why? We know what it's called, regeneration. But it does it because nobody ever told it it couldn't. 
And that's where we need to get with our identity in Christ. We need to stop letting people tell us we can't be righteous. We got to stop letting people tell us we can't be blameless and we can't be one with God. We got to stop doing that. And we, the Bible talks about the regeneration of the mind. The renewal of the regeneration of the mind in the New Testament. The Apostle Paul talks about the renewal of the regeneration of the mind. And it's time, I think somewhere along the line, you know, they call it amnesia or whatever. We forgot who we were. But I think we got our identity broken off of us like that, like me stepping on that lizard tail, Dr. Bill. It's time we grew that mind back. You know, it's time that we grew the mind of Christ back and our identity and we got, we walk in that regeneration of the mind and, and realize, you know, we are who God says we are and nobody's going to tell us we can't be. Can you hear me? I can't hear you. Is that better? I can hear you now. Okay, yeah, still learning about the settings and things on this okay. new, new set. So let, let me give everybody a plug about the show in the morning just because of something you said. I, I wasn't going to mention anything about the show uh, in, in the morning, but um, that's this because you're talking about regenerated. Now, years ago when I believed in the devil, a literal devil, because I hear this all the time, how the devil will make you. And I'm thinking about, God doesn't even try to make me do anything. He loves me into it. And I know, I know if there was a real devil, he's not going to love me. Uh, he's going to hate me, uh, for one, because I'm a, a believer. And if I wasn't, it would be for what I might become. Uh, but, but, but when I did believe in a devil, which I realize now, uh, according to the Greek language, is really just the, the unrenewed thoughts of my own mind speaking to it, especially if you were with me in the book of Revelation the last a couple of weeks, talking about how the, the, the thoughts that prophesy to you out of your own unrenewed thinking. And we always equated that to something else. But, but let, let me say this real quick. Uh, when we talk about uh, regenerated, so, so I heard this voice say to me, I was, running, I was in a, a plant running a radial arm saw and I was cutting blocks of wood uh, for this project. And um, I heard this voice speak to me and these words were very clear, just as if they were almost audible and said, I'm gonna cut your hand off. Huh. And you know what, instantly without thinking, jumped right out of my, my heart. I said, go ahead, I'll grow a new one. Wow. Amen. Now, now I realized that was just fear speaking out of my unrenewed mind. But here's the thing. When we, when we hear, see, see a, a uh, you know, my, I prayed for my little granddaughter uh, many years ago. She had a, a twisted spine not, uh, and, and just touched her on the back and her spine moved. And, and straightened and she, she on one side literally was sunk in from the other side and she, today she's a cheerleader a very 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 active I mean she doesn't have no no issue there but but when I think about that I think about people are always we really go crazy over miracles and I'm not against miracles I've seen legs grow and I've seen uh, you know people's teeth uh, uh, healed I've seen all kinds of stuff uh, people get up out of a wheel out of wheelchairs that had been um, had strokes and were paralyzed and etc. all kinds of stuff. But, but think about it. Is it really, uh, and I'm not trying to discredit miracles. I'm going somewhere. So hang, hang with me. Is it really uh, a miracle? Oh, that's miraculous. Or is this just the natural regenerative process that God always intended? Because do you know, in the morning, I'm going to be talking about Revelation 21.1, that John saw a new heaven and a new earth. For the old heaven and the old earth were passed away. Do you know that the word new, uh, uh, neos, actually is figuratively used as the word regenerated? Wow. There and you I go. I didn't know if you knew that or remembered that, but, but when he says you're going to get a new heaven and a new earth, of course, the new heaven, uh, we're talking about higher realm thinking. We're not talking about a place where we're going to go because oranas, heaven, is the abode of God. It's the way the words used, and and of course, again, you got to pay attention to context, and you got to pay attention to how it was translated, and and you know all of that. But but when you think about that, the 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 heaven of my thinking 
and and is is going to and you think about Jewish culture, the heavens, the earth, the sea, okay, the temple, the holy of holies, the the inner court, the outer court, and it all related to those in Jewish culture. So think about it this way. Uh, the, I'm going to get a new heaven, a new earth. That's my own regeneration. It's going to be new, regenerated, and the sea shall be no more. There so you go. Represents the realm where people really don't know God and can't really connect to God. That part is never going to exist again. Now that's, that's what right. happened, but people just haven't been awakened to that. And so I just wanted to share that in terms of that. That when we talk about regeneration, we're talking about anything. I mean, somebody taught it this way. Uh, Dr. Cindy, that that in the spirit realm, there are warehouses that each of us have that are full of parts. So you have a heart wears out, you can get a new part. Uh, you, your mind wears out, you can get a new part. Um, you know, an arm wears out, you can get a new part. I mean, you know, this, and is it really miraculous or is it already ours and it's just a part of this natural regeneration process and again don't nobody uh, click off and get mad i'm not trying to put down the miraculous i believe in miracles i I've, I've seen miracles i still see miracles but i just want to say this to you that that there was a time when mankind again this is based on an old covenant mindset that we thought we were alienated from god Okay, that scripture wasn't about us, by the way, that Paul's talking about in Colossians 121. It was about the Old Testament people, and Paul was trying to get these new covenant believers who were Jewish to realize that, you know, you, you, you thought in your own mind that you were alienated and, and far from God. The Passion Translation that through, says through, uh, though you were once distant from him, living in the shadows of your evil thoughts and actions, he reconnected you back to himself. When did he reconnect us back to himself in terms of our thinking while we were still in our, the shadows of our own evil thinking? That's so it. Doing our own evil stuff, our, our own actions. And yet, while we're doing that, Without his permission, there's another word for rec reconnected, and that's the word reconcile. He reconciled us back to him. So can I say this tonight? If you're watching or you're, you're seeing this a month after the fact or a year after the fact, and you think that God's mad at you, I want to tell you, how can God be mad at you when God actually reconnected you back to him without you even knowing it? And without even getting your permission? And so I would just say this to you. You're connected to God whether you like it or not. Amen. We call that Jehovah Sneaky. <laughs> <laughs> Jehovah he did Sneaky. it. He snuck in that righteousness. He snuck in that beautiful connection when we weren't even looking for it. And we didn't even know it existed. Yeah. Amen. That's so cool about God. Uh, just... You know, he was never confused. Um, his identity is secure. Uh, I, I'm the one that kind of, and, and I say I'm the one because I talk about myself as being a part of all mankind. It's just that Paul said it each in his own order. Some are connecting quicker. Some are taking a little while longer. But I'm, I'm going to tell everybody that's listening tonight, uh, I don't care what you think about the guy down the road or the lady next door or somebody in another country. I don't care what you think about them. Uh, the Bible says that uh, God is not, um, um, uh, how does it say that? Uh, oh, the Lord is not slack concerning yeah. his promise. Yeah. In that, and I'm not quoting it exactly, but in that he is not willing that any should perish, but all come to repentance. Come to what? To repentance. What is repentance? Change the way you think. It, it's not, it, he's not slack. He doesn't want anybody to perish in any way, shape, or form. And I would say it this way just to uh, liberate without actually trying to interpret the verse. I would say that, that God never did create a system where you could perish. Amen. Creation. It, the, the system doesn't exist. You can't get lost in God's system. If you've been lost in the paperwork, the, the system of the IRS or, or, or of, the, of, of the state or, or so my wife worked for child support. I want to tell you, uh, you can't get lost in the system. Uh, God knows exactly who you are. 
and he's not willing that anything bad happen to you, but that you come to a change of mind. And it may take you a little bit longer. And I want to tell you something. I have, I have years ago, Dr. Cindy, you know what I would tell people when they would gripe about the church? I would say, you know what? I have confidence in my father. Therefore, I have confidence that everything's going to be okay in the church. Well, I'll tell you, I've, I've kind of adjusted that to that, you know, I have confidence in my father, and I also have confidence that everything's going to turn out just fine in his creation. God doesn't make mistakes. He doesn't do mess ups. He just fix, he fix stuff in the eternal Christ. And whether you like it or not, you may not be expressing the fixed posture right now. Okay, they may, they may not be who you're projecting in your life, but you are a person who has been uh, made whole, been made right. All because God chose to uh, make you that way. And and next week I can't get in, or wait. I get um, uh, I can't uh, wait to get into the Passion Translation on this verse because there's some really neat metaphors and breakdowns. But uh, uh, so um, Brett Erickson uh, says, why does something have to reconnect something that was never discon? Oh man, that's good. That is good. Only that is good. You is remind. That's really good that they were never disconnected. And that's the thing about reconnection, re, um, in the, the Latin language, which was Latin was before Greek. Uh, I think they translated Latin first because there was some Latin uh, speaking believers that needed another translation or needed something in their own language. And uh, re is, is re, and there, it doesn't just say re, it's re, leger, uh, to, and that's another part of a word, but, but it, it means to be re, connected so we were first connected and how we were reconnected was in our own thinking so let me let me qualify that just a little bit further uh, uh for for brett erickson there and for everybody watching it, to be reconnected it wasn't about god it was about us we had to be convinced that we connected to god so he called it reconciliation and again it would be important for people to go back and study reconciliation reconciled words like that to see what they actually meant in the uh, first century language to get a better picture of what of what here's one of what god meant by it <laughs> what god meant by it because that's yeah. what we're supposed to be doing you know a theologian is someone who explains god to their generation yeah. You know, that's what a theologian is. That's what my doctorate degree is in theology. And people say, what is a theologian exactly? A theologian is someone who is God has called to explain him to their generation. And that's why each theologian has their own style and verbiage. And it depends on what culture you're called to communicate, communicate to. Um, yes. But that's extremely good, what you just said. And I'll say this. Um, a lot of what we're talking about is um, Jesus said, unless you become like a little child, you cannot, you can't wrap your hand, head around all this stuff. We have to go back to being very trusting. And, and like you said, you trust God, you trust God and you trust him to take care of his church. You trust God to take care of things. This is about trusting God to be God. You know, right. be, it's it's like we got to stop trying to be, figure it out. He never did say figure it out. He said believe. He never asked us to figure anything out. You know, and boy, does that take the pressure off of it. You know, just mm -hmm. to believe and trust, trust the goodness of God. We shall see the goodness of God in the land of the living. Yeah, and and we are. Uh, in the land of the living, and and I would say that we are we are the the, the land of the living. Yes, and we I, are. I say that because you know when we talk about yes. the um, when we talk about the the Lamb's Book of Life, and I've said this before on different shows, it actually was translated wrong. It should be the the Book of the Lamb's Life. And you are the book of the Lamb's life. You are written in the book of the Lamb's life because you are the book of the Lamb's life. And so we, we really have a whole lot of explaining to. I love Bible college. I love teaching. I love studying because uh, there is so Thanks, much man. that needs to be redefined because in my generation, it was never defined properly in the first place. And uh, my body, uh, my, my birth certificate says that I am currently about 65 and a half years old. I, I don't want age to be the, the ruling factor in my life. Um, but, uh, but when I think about that, um, 
what I would say is that for almost uh, uh, a, a century, I have been, I've had things taught wrong to me, and now I am undoing and relearning so that, um, yeah, so that I can come back to a right uh, perception of things, and so I can teach others. That's what I tell young people, uh, younger folks, you know, that, that uh, we teach. I say, you got to give us a minute because we're having to um, unlearn before we learn. Because like we're having to dump a lot of old programs. I told them, mm -hmm. you know, because um, thank God we're continuing to grow. And, you know, as we age, we grow in our understanding, you know, of God and who we are and, and what he, um, what he's doing in us now. And so it's like, I just thank God that we have the uh, grace and not cognitive dissonance because so often people have so much cognitive dissonance they cannot dump they cannot unlearn that they're mm -hmm. so emotionally entangled with with what their favorite pastor taught them when they were a teenager well i can tell you this my favorite pastors and my favorite teachers and my favorite ministers there's there's still people i love dearly to this very day just because they taught me wrong stuff doesn't mean that I'm mad at them because they believe they believed wrong stuff. And even now, those some of those same people are asking me, thank God, you know, they're still here. They're in their 80s. They're retired, so to speak. But they're like asking me to send them all my teaching material that I'm writing so that they can learn. Mm -hmm. How about is it that crazy? I mean, the people that taught me wrong are now wanting me to teach them right. Uh, that is like only by the grace of God could that ever happen. Oh, yeah. And that came really from me being willing, me being willing to let go of things that were not true and them being willing and humble to understand they were not taught right and so you know so we're in this we're in this beautiful time really it's a beautiful time that everybody's brave enough to learn true absolutely absolutely and and i love the time we live in uh when i was young uh, I wanted to, I wish I could have lived back in the Bible days, wish I could have walked with Jesus, walked with the disciples. If I was going to go to heaven, I, I had questions for the disciples. I had questions, for, but, but quite honestly, uh, I, I, you know, when I became a man, I put away childish things. I, I'm just glad to be here. I, I, I love the moment I live in, in terms of the revelation that, that, and I told someone this way several years back, and I don't know the exact time, um, how many years now. But it was when I agreed to quit arguing with the Lord and quit getting mad about the book of Revelation and just whatever he showed me, that's what I was going with. And, it, and I told someone that when I made that commitment, it was like the floodgates of Revelation opened to me and they haven't shut off yet. And, people, and I don't want to put, this was not an advertisement for everybody watching. I'm not saying if you send me your favorite scripture and, you know, I'll, I'll interpret it for you. I'm not saying that because I don't know everything, but, but I will say that oftentimes when I'm looking at things and, and I know that they don't seem to make sense um, and, and, and an interpretation or an avenue of revelation opens up about it. And, you know, quite honestly here, I'm, I'm in, been just finished Revelation 20 and I'm in chapter 21 and I'm flying blind in terms of that it's just me and Holy Spirit. And, and I'm loving it because what I'm thinking is going to be difficult is not difficult at all. And I don't say that braggingly. I'm just saying that, you know, some people are, 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 are called to teach uh, at an area. Some people are called to teach others. And, and there are people who, who teaches the same thing, but in different ways. And so I, I love uh, my portion. And I know that you love yours, Dr. Cindy. And um, it's so good to be sharing with people about this wonderful uh, subject that we've been talking about. So we're going to be back next week. We're going to talk more about righteousness unveiled over the next couple of weeks. And uh, we're going to see where this goes. Yeah, good. I love it.
I'm always a, I'm always honored. It's a privilege to be with everybody, and and um, I just I'm happy that we've got something so precious to share, and that's the righteousness of God. Absolutely, absolutely. And and uh, Apostle Jermaine got caught up at work, um, so he wasn't okay. able to be on. But um, we missed him. We missed him. Yeah, yeah. Always, I, I miss uh, anybody that's not on. So. Uh, we'll see everybody next week. Thank you for watching. And please click like and share. And I'll put a reminder here in just a moment. But uh, let people know about this because this was really some interesting uh, material. And and uh, uh, Brett said tonight, he said, you know, he loves this because we're making people think more and more. And that's that's really what I want to do. I want to get people to think. I'm not trying to convince you to buy into everything I teach. I just want you to think about it and because if you do if you meditate on it at some point it'll either speak to you or it won't speak to you you'll either get it or you won't get it but uh what will happen is truth will will unfold to you and that was the whole point about what god was trying to do so thank you so much everybody for joining us thank you dr cindy uh it's always a blessing to have you on all right, everybody. Good night. We'll see you next time. Have a great day. Don't forget, if you're really interested in what we've been talking about tonight, don't forget to join me at 10 o'clock in the morning, Central Standard Time, Revelation 21, verse 1. If you've had, I spend a whole session on just the one single verse because there is so much that belongs in that that you really want to get set right. If you got messed up from Genesis chapter two all the way to now, I'm going to explain a little bit about that and you might want to watch it, okay? So if you can't watch it, it'll at least be recorded. You'll be able to watch it from Facebook or the YouTube channel. We'll see everybody then. Have a great evening. Bye-bye, everyone.